Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and I know you guys missed me. It's been a very long 24 hours since our show yesterday. I hope you guys enjoyed talking to Mark Lopez, the CTO of Drop Delivery. It is a great company. I'm really excited to see what they're doing in this space. Folks, we've got another awesome episode coming up for you on Friday. We've got Tom Grebenstein from Takun Olam. I'm really excited to speak to them. If you guys don't know who Takun Olam is, it is an Israeli cannabis company. And if you don't know anything about Israel, which shocking, it's all over the news now, so learn one or two things. But they've been studying medical cannabis for much, much longer than we are. So I'm very excited to talk to Tom. I'm very excited to tell you guys about the origins of Takun Olam. Folks, today I am I'm I'm very excited to have our guest today. Um, I'm a little worried that I'm not going to be able to hold my own in a conversation with him. He I've listened to podcasts and other interviews that he's done. He hosts his own show on on his own company's website, and I've never heard someone get so granular when it comes to growing and the conditions and the science and the outputs of lights and all this stuff. And I've been around a lot of really smart scientific people, so. I promise to you, the audience, I will do my best to make this an interesting conversation and try to sound like I am the intelligent, capable human being that you guys, for some reason, believe that I am, but I might expose myself as a lovable idiot that you guys will soon get to know. So with no further ado, please welcome the Chief Science Officer of AgriFi, David Kessler. David, thank you for joining us. Todd, thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you to all the listeners for making the time to hear us chat. Of course, man. No, it is, it's a pleasure to have you on the show because there are certain things that I take for granted when we do this show. A lot of us in the industry, we have a general knowledge of cannabis and the growing process, and we've been to grows and things like that. But again, I made this show not for the folks in the industry, but for those that are on the outside to have a look into the industry, right? So I think this this conversation is certainly going to be very educational to a lot of folks there. Um, I want to dig into your background a little bit because you, your background comes very deep from cultivating cannabis. In fact, as I understand it, you cultivated cannabis before you ever consumed it, which that, I think that's a first. I don't know if it's a first, but I certainly did. Um, when I was a teenager, all of my friends started smoking cannabis well before I did. I was part of the D.A.R.E. generation and drugs are bad. So it took me a while to come around, but I couldn't understand why every day was all of the time was spent trying to find where the next bag was going to come from, then where to smoke it, then where to get more. And I pointed out to my friends after being, you know, physical labor for my parents, uh, agriculturally speaking, since I could walk, that it comes with the seeds in every bag. Why don't we just start growing this? And so even before I smoked it, I was popping seeds and I fell in love with the genetic diversity, the variety of colors of the plant, the pistols, the aromas, and it really has become a lifelong passion. So before I ever smoked, I I definitely was growing and that's been, gosh, going on close to 30 years now. Oh, wow. That is a a long time to be cultivating cannabis. So when you first started doing that, like, hey, that was a great, a genius observation, like, hey. They're giving you free refills in this bag. We just got to grow it, right? But obviously, you know, it, it's not something that you're going to grow in your home garden or somewhere that that's relatively easy to see. You know, tell me, take me back to those early days because it was a hard plant to be passionate about not too long ago. And for you to do that and take care of it and still be here talking about it, you know, that that's, that's ballsy because people like you helped us get here, right? So tell me about, you know, where was your first grow? How did you figure it out? Because it, as much as weed grows like a weed, as we say, it, it's also a, a finicky mistress and, and you can lose a batch pretty easily. Definitely. So my first garden was in my parents' home. I knocked through a wall in their basement to an area of a porch that had just been walled off. And so my first grow, I was running extension cords through the wall, uh, (laughs) bringing in lights from a country club that had upgraded their fluorescence. I mean, it looked like something out of a horror movie, Uh, lights everywhere and wires and heat lamps. I had no idea what I was doing. Eventually I found uh, the Cannabis Bible. It was Ed Rosenthal's book and that helped a lot. I read it cover to cover to the point where 
it was worn through. Uh, I read George Cervantes's book, uh, several other people's. And what became the crux of my education was the available literature at the time. Uh, there was very few books that were published. Uh, there was High Times, which had some good information here and there. But really, it was trial and error and those foundational books. But what I really learned was how to build a grow room, or more to the point, maybe, Todd, how not to build a grow room. Um, in my experience, what I have found has been that you encounter problems based on the facilities you design, whether it's a grow room, a closet, or a full 10,000, 50,000 square foot facility the mistakes that you make should not be repeated. And so to that point, I had great many years of learning experiences of what not to do. Uh, that coupled with a voracious appetite to learn more about the plant, to seek out the new strains, the genetic diversity that I had heard about, but hadn't been readily available stateside, uh, really is how I got started. Dude, I mean, that's such a cool story just because of how you started out and where you are now, you know, you started out just like anybody else with trial and error and fast forward to today, you won, you know, you, you run some of the, or, or have built some of the most technologically advanced grow rooms in the country. So it's like, you know, I always love hearing these stories of people kind of bending the rules when they're, when they're kids, but realistically being the, the genesis of what they're going to do with their life. Like we have another guest and friend of the show, Maha Hawk, who got, caught by her mom smoking pot was told to write basically a dissertation paper on it. And that led Maha going down the rabbit hole of cannabis research, you know, with you, it was, Hey, we have these seeds and then setting up that grow with the, with the extension cords and everything else to fast forward, you know, the vertical farming and all the great stuff that you're doing at AgriFi. So I love hearing those Genesis stories. It's almost like the superhero origin stories that we love in all these comic books. Right. Um, I've got to ask you, and I know, you know, we didn't have camera phones and everything else not too long ago. Do you have a picture of any of the original grows? Because that would be the coolest thing to have framed in your office. Uh, no, not at all. I really lived by some of the guidance in those early books, which was loose lips end up in jail. <laughs> yep. um, so, you know, whether it was a college roommate, uh, a girlfriend, people generally didn't know that this was a passion of mine, a side project. Uh, up until I was able to do it legally. And so it was really refreshing to be able to talk about something, to be able to do something uh, in the light that you had done for so long in the shadows. You know, my first grow lights, Todd, uh, I mentioned these fluorescents I got from a country club that was upgrading. But after that, I'd read all about high pressure sodiums and metal halide lights. And there were no grow shops where I was. Um, yeah. It was a long time ago. They weren't as prevalent. So, you know, a couple of corporate office parks in the middle of the night got poles knocked down and I ripped lights off of, uh, you know, live electrical wires and rewired them, figured out how to do the electric. And, you know, eventually that got to the point where I could run circuits in the house and wire electric. But I mean, when we talk about the origin of legacy cultivation, you know, we didn't have some of the... Uh, benefits that we have today, whether that's uh, knowledge institutionalized and shared amongst the community, or whether it's access to supplies. Uh, I mean, those early entrants into the space really did have to quite literally forge the way uh, with some unorthodox means for sure. I mean, it's crazy. I, you know, recently there was a picture floating around. It was like, the high times top strains of like 1970 or something like that. And you look at those pictures, you bring up high times magazine, but you look at those pictures and you talk to anyone who considers themselves a connoisseur or in today's day, they wouldn't touch any of the bud in that magazine. It all looks like dirt, if you will. So it's crazy how far cannabis has come along. I mean, how I'm sure where, where you see it going from the old outdoor golf course adjacent grows to now, you know, vertical farms that scale football fields. Like, and not only that, we're getting much more quality weed. It's crazy. For, I'm, I mean, I'm sure for you, it has to be crazy to see just the evolution of how the growing process has changed the plant. Most definitely. And I think it's 
a lot of thanks to the growers that kept these genetics going. So, you know, you point out the lineage, those 1970s era strains that were closer to land race genetics. Uh, and really where we've come in 50 years in terms of breeding, but we've done that without commercial breeding programs, with the legacy market doing much of the work, without universities being able to apply modern applications of, of technology and science. So again, all credit to the growers that took these genetics that you would call dirt, that, that we would not really look favorably upon today and turn them into something. Uh, so, you know, much thanks to all of the guys and gals that have been doing this for a long time, preserving genetics, doing their own breeding, and bringing us to the forefront where we are now. When I look at breeding today, I'm both excited for where we are and even more excited for the future because yeah. we have gotten all of this progress through essentially nothing more than small scale selective breeding. Uh, when I look at commercial operations that Bear runs or another breeder uh, on a commercial level of agriculture, they don't run 10 plants or 100 plants when they're looking for new phenotypes. They run tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. They do trial gardens all over the country in different climates to make sure that the varieties work in different areas and different uh, humidity, temperature, uh, and, and climates. And with all of that, the cannabis that we are going to see in the next 10 and 20 years is going to be incredible because those same techniques, that same level of science, moving away from selective breeding into marker assisted breeding, uh, using the DNA, the cladistics that we have, it's really exciting to know that they're going to push that envelope even further than they have today. That's really cool. And, and I think, you know, this is a good time to plug Agrify and what you guys do, um, because you and I had talked and we talked about the MSOs and the brands that are going from state to state. Just one that comes top of mind for me, just because I talk about them often, like Binsk, which is in Colorado. It's in California. They're also partnering with True Leaf down here in Florida, whereas in no fault to theirs, they're different growing environments. You know, Colorado's up in the mountains. You've got great weather in California, depending on where you are. You've got Florida, which is humid as can be. And you're trying to put out the same strains and you're trying to give out this, you're trying to give the same customer experience as best you can in these drastically different environments, which like you said, is very hard to do. I'm going to over, 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 over simplify the crap out of what you do, but for those, those of you who are very simple-minded, as I understand it, the Agrify solution is essentially like, and please take this with a grain of salt, a cannabis microwave. And I only say that in the sense of the word that you can control the environment for the plant specifically to what it needs. So to me, it's like that Ronco grill where you set it and forget it. I'm sure there's a lot more complications to that, but it's like, okay, here's the strain. This is what the relative humidity needs to be. This is what this needs to be. And I'm literally the only stat I know is relative humidity, but <laughs> you know what I mean? I this do. is what all this needs to be to grow this strain. And because it's self-contained, it can be grown similar in California or in Florida or in Connecticut. Am I, I know I oversimplified the crap out of it, but can you give us the more complicated explanation? I'd be happy to. And you did a, a pretty good job of setting me up. So thank you. I mean, what we have to appreciate is the outcome of any cannabis plant is the combination of DNA and the environment, nature and nurture. And so while you can't get a, uh, you know, nine foot tall basketball player, if the parents are, you know, three feet tall, you're not going to get exceptional cannabis if you don't start with good genetics. But the DNA only determines a range of what can potentially happen the environment dictates where in that range the outcome falls. And so Agrify's technology, if I was gonna simplify it and explain it to the audience, it would be, think of a grow tent of your dreams. The grow tent is almost magic. It records a million data points per year. It can control your temperature within half a degree Fahrenheit accurately at all times. It can control your relative humidity, your CO2, your vapor pressure deficit, your light intensity spectrum, photo period, fertigation, irrigation, down to the milliliter and second. Essentially, like you called it, it can be a set it and forget it kind of way of cultivating. But because the internal environment is so closely controlled, 
so granularly controlled and able to be reproduced, if I have one of the AgriFi vertical farm units in an if indoor facility in California, one in Alaska, and one in New York, as long as the recipes are set the same and the DNA is identical, the outcomes have an absolute minimal amount of variation. To give you an idea, one of our clients had 12 batches of flour, different harvest times, 12 batches, same strain. There was less than 1% variation in the cannabinoid content and less than one tenth of a percent variation in the terpene profile, all the way across all the batches. And you do that by minimizing the variation, the plasticity uh, exerted by the environment on that genetic. And so not only does it allow you to grow consistently, but what I love as a scientist, as a cultivator, is I get to do iterative experiments. I get to see what actually works better. So since the chambers are so tightly controlled, if I have the new jokers or the pink mints uh, strain that is really hot, but I haven't grown it before, I might run it in four different vertical farm units at different temperatures or with different light intensities. And after just one cycle, I'll have so much more information about how that strain prefers to be grown that I can then use that information and continually iterate and improve my process. So it's really the next generation of cultivation that delivers consistent process and consistent cannabis. See, I, as a modernist and as a fan of the industry, I really love it, right? Like I, I think that is what our industry needs for consistency across states. Like, and it's, you know, and, and it, it's just because you have all these great California brands that go into new markets and they're not delivering a similar experience to no fault of their own. It's just, it's too hard for them to pull off, right? So to have the ability, and, and I equate it this way, I was talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about the weed in California and, you know, he just kind of dropped the statement, man, California weed is just so different. I'm like, yeah, it's New York pizza. That's exactly what it is. We have good weed here. But when you smoke weed from California, it's like, oh, shit, I forgot how good that is. It's the same thing with New York pizza. I live in the sixth borough of New York, South Florida. We've got great pizza down here. It doesn't equate to when I land in Manhattan and go grab a slice. It doesn't equate to that first bite. So, you know, I look at the outlook and there are good strains that are grown in Florida. There are historic Florida strains that we have, but there are a lot of great California strains that I would love to have here and have that experience. And if we can't have interstate commerce, this is the way to do it right? Which is why I really love what you guys are doing. I'd like to kind of take a step back so people understand how technologically advanced this is and kind of talk about the evolution of just growing cannabis in general, because it started very much from outdoor off the beaten path, hidden grows, moving indoor hydroponic grows and everything else. And now we have this vertical farming, as you said, the lights have evolved, like so much stuff has gone into it that it truly has almost transcended from just pure agriculture to more science? I wouldn't disagree. I think that we're really at a point now where we're seeing the intersection of legacy cultivation, legacy best practices, and the application of both modern uh, agricultural best practices, but also research coming specific to cannabis, cannabis and hemp. Uh, and that is a real change. When we go back into the history of cultivation, you know, the first thing that happened was people were popping the seeds that was in their flower, exactly like I did. Uh, then you grow that out. Then the Cali guys started crossbreeding a couple strains. You get into some of the early hazes. You start seeing people going on missions to collect seed varietals from around the world. That becomes the backstock of your breeding. I mean, uh, there's so much history there. We definitely don't have a chance to go into all of the genetic side. But on the cultivation, you know, what really drove this is it drove us inside was the legality. Uh, if you were growing outside, you were risking your, your livelihood, your, your longevity, yeah. uh, your freedom. And so people started growing inside. And then they developed incredible strains that had incredible aromas. The aromas were getting people caught. We in California used to call it, there was time BC, before carbon filters. Because before carbon, you were really restricted on what you could grow inside or a cop was gonna knock on your door because it smelled from two blocks away, unmistakably so. 
Uh, so the evolution of things like air cleaning allowed people to grow more indoors. The increase in lighting technology, the evolution of LEDs, which I'd been waiting for 20, 25 years since High Time started talking about it, but only in the last 10 years did they really come into their own. And, um, you know, we're at a point now where the industry is actually now shaping agricultural technology. And so let me explain that. For a long time, we benefited from the technology that was developed for agriculture and for other industries. And we incorporated that into our grows the best way we could. Now with the legality of cannabis changing and shifting and the price point of the crop, there is research going into photobiology that would never work for lettuce. There's a, a two penny margin per head. You can't make it justified. But with cannabis, if I can increase my yield by 10% per life, then all of a sudden the technology is worth the investment on the R&D. And so we're seeing these huge jumps in efficiency and lighting, improvements in environmental control systems. And it's all driven by a new era of legal cannabis and a high market. You know, it, it's really interesting that you say that because for the longest time, and, and I'm not definitely not the person who came up with this or, or who says it the most, but I would very harp on looking at federal legalization because what this industry is doing from creating jobs, creating revenue streams and everything else. And to hear what you just said, that this industry is starting to revolutionize traditional agriculture because, like you said, the incremental increases in this industry are large enough that it makes sense that other farmers and everything else are benefiting from it. I think that really just enforces the economic impact of our industry on the country as a whole, beyond just the direct jobs that it's creating, beyond just the direct tax revenue streams that it's creating, but the innovation that's going to trickle out into other industries, these companies, these LED companies, these companies like AgriFi that are not only going to continue to R&D and focus on the cannabis space, but also move into traditional agriculture and help our regular farmers out of the rut that they've been in for so long because just the way agriculture is in this country, it's exciting to me, right? And, and here is just more evidence of that happening. I mean, you know, to, to see cannabis leading the charge and bringing other industries with it, 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 it's, it feels great, right? It feels like we're doing, and I'd love for you to weigh in here, but it feels like not only are we starting to wipe away the stigma, it's like, holy crap, like this is changing our country. And I'd love to see everybody else kind of take notice of that. You know, I wish they would. And I'd say that there has been a stigma around cannabis for a very long time. But I think that I don't know if we're wiping it away or if it's been wiped away. Uh, the majority of citizens in this country want legal adult use cannabis. The majority of citizens believe in the medical efficacy of cannabis. Uh, we employ more people than the coal sector of the energy industry as a cannabis industry. And we're continuing to evolve and take more and more of a market share. And, you know, I'd like to see people using cannabis to relieve some of their medical ailments instead of the wealth of pharmaceuticals that are pushed upon us. Um, that said, in terms of this industry standing up and being proud and taking kind of ownership for the fact that they are leading the way in some of this agricultural revolution, uh, I think it's inevitable. We're already there. We are pulling the best uh, plant scientists from the world into our industry. Uh, we're really changing agriculture as a whole. And uh, it's exciting to be both a part of that industry and be helping to shape where that industry evolves. Um, to make the most impact down the road, to, to see where that future can go and to help shape. It. No, it is very exciting. I'd be curious to know, you know, a lot of the old school growers and a lot of the OGs in this industry, right? I, I imagine that they like the innovation and everything else, but they're very stubborn, like most OGs in, in any industry, right? So the more and more, every, every time we're talking, we have this conversation, you talk about where we came from and where we are. I just have this image in my head of like the worst cannabis sitcom ever, where it's like the odd couple, where you have like a traditional OG grower who's in charge of everything. And then they bring in the young buck scientist and he tries to like change his ways and everything else. And at first they butt heads and then one realizes the other knows what he's talking about. 
But I imagine that the real life isn't too different where it's like, no, I know what I'm doing. I know these strains. I know this genetics. And they're like, wait, what does it do? Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. Well, can I do this? And then all, you know, a week later, even by the end of the conversation, like, all right, all right, I'll give it a chance. And it's really that odd couple effect. You know, it is. And I'm actually ironically preparing for a lecture called the intersection of legacy cultivation techniques and modern agricultural best practices. And uh, the image is a uh, kind of hippie OG guy riding a VW bus crashing headlong into a technological grow. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the presentation that I'm putting together illustrates that the two weren't so far off. The legacy cultivators had a lot of experiential knowledge, things that they attributed that were subjective, observational based, not proven scientifically that are now starting to be proven in the academic world. So to give you a couple of examples of this intersection of the, the young buck, you know, science, if you will, and the legacy OG guys, you know, we've all seen lights really play a huge part in the outcome of our cannabis. Uh, lighting technology has evolved from fluorescence to HIDs to uh, LEDs now, a couple of small steps or jumps in, the, in between. But the research is now showing that you get a linear increase in yield and cannabinoids up to and through 1800 micromoles. The old research was 1500, but there were other people saying it was a thousand. Now, if you talk to legacy growers, I mean, even people like uh, Josh H that did the three alight, right? Their whole premise is more light over the same area and particular planting techniques. A lot of the legacy guys were definitely going with heavy amounts of light over a smaller area. Now, they didn't have the scientific research to back it up, but we do now. And we can say unequivocally that you'll see that increase in yield and cannabinoid level if you increase your light. We have new data on flushing techniques for post-harvest. We have techniques for cloning that can shave a week off of your harvest times just simply by changing the way you cut your clones. And all wow. of this is the intersection of these new scientific researchers documenting, helping to prove out a lot of this legacy information that we all kind of knew, but never got institutionalized. Because legacy growers, it turns out, are all allergic to one thing, and it's, it's handcuffs, um, highly allergic to handcuffs. So you didn't keep records. You didn't do research, right? You did the best grow, and most of it was up here in your head. Um, now we're seeing this research really validating a lot of these legacy cultivation practices, but also improving cultivation as a whole. And if you are not adopting these best practices, unfortunately, uh, you will get left behind. I mean, other people will, and your cannabis won't add up. Yeah. I mean, I am a, a big fan of data, right? Like I, I think this industry is, is lacking in it. The more data that we can have in this industry, the better, because like you said, a lot of people understood what they were doing, but they may not have understood why they got the outcome. I do something similar on the business side of this, right? You know, you know what I do as far as helping brands advertise with text message, but half of what we do is the data that follows up to understand customer behavior. What you guys are doing is essentially what we're doing for the sales and marketing team for the cultivation team, which if you think about it, you know, those guys stereotypically you wouldn't think would be data guys, but at the end of the day, I've met a lot of them and they can't get enough of it. I know I made the odd couple joke, but I've been in enough grows to understand like, no, they want to know the inputs and everything else and, and down to, to the, the little, the littlest things. But it's cool because the way that you're explaining this to me is not Agrify does not just provide the great hardware that's going to help you grow, but it's also sounds like there's like a SAS component too, that gives you access to a database that, you know, you, you may not be able to get anywhere else, like the most pertinent thing that you can have. So, I mean, for you, you guys are almost like a next level company where it is hardware and SaaS, but at the end of the day, you're also an agriculture company. So you're just spanning so many different verticals. Yeah, we, we consider ourselves an agricultural technology company. The hardware is a critical component, but really the secret sauce is the systems engineered software that was designed to work hand in hand with our hardware. A lot of growers, you know, they're used to trying to get the best lights, the best HVAC, the best environmental management systems, the software, the nutrient injection systems. 
then they got to put it all together and make it work and make the pieces talk to each other or interact with one another with them as the liaison. That's too much. So our hardware and software work seamlessly together. To give you an idea, not only are we controlling all of those environmental uh, data points and the environment inside, we're also correlating all of that data to your test results, looking at harvest over harvest. So there's beautiful spark line charts that'll show you from crop cycle to crop cycle to crop cycle, how your cannabinoid levels did, how your terpene levels did. We even have calculators that you can look at two different VFUs or five different VFUs, as many as you want, and compare them day by day for environment, uh, hands-on actions, anything that might have impacted the outcome of the plant and help you understand why one particular vertical farm unit produced better flour than another. And that way, once you understand that, you can literally click the recipe button and replicate that over and over again in perpetuity. So it really is this combination of hardware and software. And I'm really excited for where we're taking the software because with machine learning and computer vision, uh, artificial intelligence, we're starting to add in this next generation of data uh, analysis that is going to help our cultivators become even better at what they do. We always say, you know, we are not a replacement for growers at all. We are the ultimate toolbox. We empower them and give them the tools at their disposal to grow the best cannabis uh, possible. I mean, you know, again, not to add, you know, not to keep selling your product for you, but I think it's more peace of grind. It's more peace of mind for the growers, right? You don't, human error is a big problem in any business, right? And, and it's natural. That's just what happens. So if you have the ability to have a unit where you can take out as much human error as you can and get the exact inputs that you want, that's, that's peace of mind to, to a grower. So hundred percent, it definitely does not replace the growers, but it certainly helps with the availability of human error, right? Um, it, it's funny to me, um, cannabis advocates all over the world and I support them want home grow. I, I personally, I don't want to say I didn't care because I want my friends and I want the people who deserve what they want to get what they want. So I do care in that sense. Todd's never going to grow at home. It's just not going to happen. Like, but you talk about the units that you have and, and, and clearly I'm not a commercial grow, but having something like that would pique my attention because it'd be fun to mess around with and mess with the inputs and grow different things. I'm certainly not going to get the old grow tent and the lights and buy the nutrients and mix. I'm, I'm not a homebrew guy. I'm not a homegrown guy, but if you guys are creating like the, uh, the Keurig of cannabis, if you will, I actually really enjoy that. I mean, that would be really cool. And I don't think this is in your business plan and don't put it in your business plan because it's probably not gonna be profitable over a long time to have a, a scaled down almost home version of what you guys are doing because that would be so much fun. You know, I think it is an interesting avenue to explore. But like you said, it's, it's a very limited uh, use case. And for the people that like to grow at home, I think that the future is really in understanding the science and being able to optimize at that smaller scale all of those inputs. So what I would hope that we could provide to those people that love to uh, cultivate at home um, is more information to make their jobs easier, to make their outcomes better. So correlating the right light levels for a strain or increasing terpene profile with a specific uh, microorganism in the rhizosphere. All of these are possibilities, but the research doesn't exist yet or it hasn't been shared. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is putting one of our VFUs in someone's home uh, just practically isn't realistic right now, maybe in the future, but where the industry is going is going to be allowing those home cultivators the learnings that we provide, that we can share with the industry and really improve everyone's cultivation. You know, they say uh, a rising tide raises all boats, if we all start sharing and institutionalizing information, then cannabis cultivation as a whole will improve. And it won't be someone's secret sauce that's sacrificed. It'll just be everyone improving together. Well, when Spotify buys this podcast for a hundred million, just like they did for Rogan, and I have my own Rogan style studio, we're going to put an Agrify unit in there just for fun. Done. You say awesome. the word. <laughs> so, 
I've mentioned this word a few times and, and I kind of think I know what it is, but I want to kind of talk about the importance of it because it is, you know, one of the advantages that you have, which is vertical farming, right? Mm -hmm. And when we look at the expansion of the cannabis industry, and again, I've been to grows, when you see a grow expand, for the most part, they're expanding width wise. And, and when I say that, I mean, they're expanding the footprint of the building in which they're growing. And at the end of the day, buildings seem to cost more the bigger that they are, right? So, you know, it's interesting to me, this concept of vertical farming, because I really see that increasing profit margins easily for, for companies, because when they want to expand their grow, they can go up as opposed to out. And if we learned anything from the island of Manhattan, that can be very profitable. So talk to me about the, ver the, the, the concept and the advantages of vertical farm. Gladly. You know, I think for a long time, people have looked at the vertical space in a cultivation, in a grow room, and wished they could do more with it. But with HID lighting, the tall ceilings, it just wasn't really practical. Um, so we all had this desire. Now, LEDs have a distributed heat load instead of a point source heat load, and it allows us to cultivate much closer to the plant. So instead of needing three feet of headspace to allow the heat to dissipate and the light to become uniform, we can do that in six inches or 12 inches now with LEDs. So it allows us to go in more vertical tiers more easily but there's inherent problems because people have always wanted that increased production. Um, but as you go up, air stratifies, temperatures change, microclimates form. Uh, you have more difficulty homogenizing the growing environment, more biomass means more transpiration, more dehumidification required. Ultimately, it becomes harder and harder to grow. So you'll see people that have tried vertical with varying degrees of success. I know there's a couple of companies now that provide like vertical racking. Well, just because I can put the plants in multiple tiers doesn't mean I can grow them. And it certainly doesn't mean I can grow them well. Controlling that environment is key, but so is working with your plants, accessing your plants. One of the biggest challenges of vertical has been how do I work comfortably on those upper levels? Uh, you know, I've seen ladders, I've seen scissor lifts, I've seen people in harnesses, uh, I've seen people standing on the top of forklifts, all these different ways. While I appreciate they're not safe, they're not efficient, and uh, ultimately they're not the way that's going to take us into the future. So AgriFi's technology, each of our growing chambers is structurally sound. And so they actually form the skeleton or the scaffolding for the levels on the second and third floors. So no matter how high you go up with an AgriFi cultivation facility, you're working from a standing position on a solid floor. Uh, you access your lower levels comfortably sitting on a rolling mechanic stool. You access your upper levels standing, but it allows a safe and efficient access to your plant. So anyone that's ever carried anything up a ladder, it sucks. Imagine mm -hmm. carrying hundreds, if not thousands of plants a day, tens or hundreds of pounds of biomass up and down every day. It's not efficient. It's not effective. It's not safe. And so we feel that our system, which integrates the working platforms, the uh, environmental controls, it really solves all of the issues with going vertical that we've seen from other purveyors trying uh, their hand. And the real difference is they're focused on a piece of the solution, the racking or the LED lighting. By doing everything as a systems engineered solution, we took all of the learnings, all of the wish lists, all of the problems, and we tried to address them and really put out the best vertical system possible. So when we look at vertical farming, when we look at KPIs that matter, the key performance indicators in the industry, you know, I've heard grams per light, grams per watt, grams per square foot. I think ultimately where we're headed is grams per square foot of canopy per day at a cost of X, because then it doesn't matter whether I go two levels up, four levels up, or I just go really wide. I can roll in all of my uh, rental costs, all of my the mortgage costs, all of the employment costs, all of the taxes. And at the end of the day, a gram costs me a dollar. Now, if I can produce a gram per square foot of canopy 
for a dollar and you produce it for 90 cents, you're winning, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's what matters. So if I take a 10,000 square foot facility and I can produce twice what you can in a 15,000 square foot facility by going vertical and we do it at the same price point, then it is just clear that operating my vertical facility is more effective than a traditional horizontal. And I think that that's where we're going to go. We're going to start seeing a shift in the KPIs that really focus on leveling the playing field and being careful not to compare apples and oranges uh, because old school grows, traditional horizontal grows, doing a gram per square foot. It's like only getting a fraction of a piece of the puzzle and uh, you just don't get the whole picture. It, it certainly makes sense. I mean, you know, grows at this point, you, you can only go so wide and there's almost there's only so much space available. Right. So the next logical solution is, is to go up. And to me, it just seems more efficient. Right. You do that with, with any building like, you know, I made the joke of a about Manhattan, but they got more people in those five square miles than we have anywhere else on the planet, right? You know, I, I'm probably China and things like that, but you know what? This is my show. America's the best. Um, so, you know, but it, it makes sense to go up. And it, I was watching, you know, I like Ke Kevin who does Cannibal and I Connect. I'm, I'm a fan of his show and I watch him a lot. And I heard you share a story that you guys were, you actually built a vertical farm unit for a deleted scene of Hunger Games. Is, is that true? Or did, am I making that up? No, but it's a little bit mixed together. So uh, earlier in my- I'm good career, at that. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> earlier in my career, I was pre-cannabis. I wasn't in the legal cannabis industry yet. I was focused on closed environmental agriculture, farm design. I had just finished- uh, designing some facilities for Georgia Tech and KSU for their research university greenhouses. Uh, and uh, a gentleman walked in and I started chatting with him to a consulting shop that we had. And uh, he unfurls these blueprints and he says, can you build this? Now I immediately recognize it. The artist stole the kind of plan set from a garden in Thailand that was publicized. And I said, sure, if they can do it, we can do it. We do this, 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 and this. It was like a Google interview, you know, how would you fit how many golf balls on a school bus? Um, and he says, you got the job. And I said, what are you talking about? He's like, well, it's for a movie set. Uh, you know, we needed someone that can help consult. You know, we'd like you to do it. Okay, great. Turns out to be the Hunger Games. So we take over the Georgia World Congress Center for over six months. We build greenhouses indoors. Uh, they grow live plants because the director wanted everything to be real. And I don't know if you or any of the fans are familiar, but District 13 was supposed to be underground. It was the resistance district. It was large. How were they going to feed the people? Well, they decided they would do it with hydroponic gardens. So we built these 30 foot tall A-frame towers, uh, 30 of them, put them on a blue screen, grew 10,000 plants of lettuce and chard and you know, really colorful leafy greens. And, uh, you know, I have pictures from the day of the shoot of Jennifer Lawrence and Philip Seymour Hoffman walking through the gardens on the blue screens. It was great. And then Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away from a heroin overdose and the scenes got deleted. But they're still around. You can find them in the cut scenes. But it was an incredible project uh, to grow the plants, to work with a, a set that really had no budget in mind. They just wanted it the way they wanted it. So it was uh, extremely uh, enlightening and really exciting to design uh, something where budget wasn't a constraint. Um, and honestly, it led to a lot more interesting projects. So the Hunger Games turned into the Allegiant series and then Black Panther. Uh, actually, the buddy of mine that wow. brought me in is right now shooting Black Panther 2. Uh, if I was in Georgia, I'd probably be working with him. <laughs> So there's no vertical cannabis farms in Black Panther 2 that we know of yet, though, right? Not that we know of yet, but maybe in the future. No, I'm kidding. I don't think Marvel would uh, really love that. <laughs> I feel like Wakanda would grow some phenomenal cannabis, but that's just my opinion. Would. I mean, their technology is beyond space age. I'm game. If, if, if Jeff calls me up and says, we need a cannabis garden in Black Panther 2, let me tell you, I will be on a plane within hours.
That's awesome, man. Dude, David, this has been a lot of fun. We always try to end the show with, with forward looking statements. You know, you've come a very long way from the original grow within the walls with the, the, extension cords and everything else to building some of the most technological grow houses in your grow rooms or facilities in the country and beyond, you know, it's hard when you're so technologically advanced to ask somebody, what is the future bringing? What do you look, you know, what are you looking at for the rest of this year and beyond? What can we get excited about from Agrify this year and next? And, you know, just the future of your involvement in the cannabis space. Oh, wow. A lot. Um, it's a loaded question. I know. Yeah, no, just a little. But no, I think it really is going to be around the incorporation of uh, machine learning, camera, uh, computer vision, artificial intelligence, really allowing the toolbox to expand with technology to give our cultivators, our operators more information. So whether it's tracking the surface area of the plant as it grows, so they know that they're on target for yield and harvest date, whether it's identifying a pest or a disease before anyone's ever even looked in one of the growth chambers, or whether it's just better understanding, excuse me, the health of your plant through visual identification in the, the, the system. Uh, I think that those are advancements that are very exciting. They're not likely to happen this year, but in the near future, they are. And I think that's technology that's going to make a difference. I also think that one of the uh, exciting things that we're seeing is a partnership with Front Range Bioscience, a bioinformatics, a leader in bioinformatics, in fact. And by developing genetics that are specifically optimized for vertical farm units, for indoor cultivation, for vertical cultivation, you'll see improvements in yield, in terpene expression, even in the aesthetic, the color of the plant. We're starting to see the ability to increase anthocyan production. So you'll see more purple flower, uh, more mm. deep red and ruby flower. But um, I think that the improvements that people are gonna see are gonna be in the technological controls and the uh, artificial intelligence that we're able to incorporate into the tech that really helps our growers. Uh, and in the very near future, I would just say to be on the lookout for some exciting press releases from Agrifa. And you can keep up Absolutely. with us uh, on all the social media handles and so very cool man well the conversations like this are the ones that excite me because putting cutting edge technology and techniques and data for that matter into the hands of the most knowledgeable people in the industry i mean i think just everybody's going to benefit from that so it's really exciting to hear you know as you guys continue to change the industry i'd love to have you back on and continue this discussion man um anything you want to leave us with anything to promote before we let you go you know, I appreciate it, Todd. Thank you for having me. I would love to come back anytime you need a guest to fill a spot. I talk way too much. My wife says people ask for a glass of water, they get a lesson in hydraulics. But uh, if you'd like to learn more about Agrify, if you have any questions for me, uh, david.kessler at agrify.com. Uh, all of the social media is at Agrify Corp. Uh, please check us out. Come to the website, www.agrify.com. And uh, if there's anything you'd like to know, information, research, please reach out to me. I'm more than an open book. I love to share. I love to teach. So uh, bring it. And uh, hopefully I'll be back on the show and we can chat again in the real near future, Todd. Absolutely. We will definitely get together soon. Hopefully next time in person. That'll be a ton of fun. Oh, yeah. And Dave, it was great having you. Thank you to David and thank you to everybody at home for watching. I know I learned a ton on, during this conversation and, and I mean this, go watch David's on the other interviews. You will learn more than you ever hope to learn. So go check him out wherever you can find him. So thank David for attending. Folks, we have one more episode this week. It's going to be Friday at 2 p.m. with Tom or yeah, Tom from Takuno Lam. Really looking forward to that one next week. We've got Rosie Matteo coming back on the show. It's been a while before. She, it's been a while since she's been on the show. I think she only worked with about 10 cannabis companies back now. Then now she works with um, all of them. So really excited to see what Rosie's up to, folks. Of course, if you missed 
any part of this conversation. It will be live on our YouTube next week on Wednesday. We do drops on Monday and Wednesday now. So Wednesday at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. And of course, if you prefer to listen to us in your car, in your office, instead of watching, you can find us on any audio platform. Just search for elevate your grind. Live episodes are always right here at facebook.com slash cannabis group. And of course, on our LinkedIn page at the cannabis lab. It's been a great episode, folks. We'll see you on Friday. Have a good night.